In today's lecture, we're talking about vector-borne diseases. The Rickettsiales are a fascinating order of bacteria that cause a wide variety of diseases. If you want to understand the epidemiology of these pathogens, it's important to know not only about the bacteria, but also the vectors which transmit them. Organisms that we're going to talk about today are obligate intracellular parasites. These bacteria are rod-shaped, and the Rickettsiaceae family are gram-negative. The Anaplasmataceae family, so another group within the Rickettsiales, uh, lack cell wall components typical of other gram-negative bacteria. The biocontainment level of these organisms depends not only on what species you're working with, but what you're actually doing with them. So they're considered level two for non-propagative laboratory procedures, if you're doing things like making blood smears or PCR, but level three when working with infectious tissues from experimentally infected animals, the vectors, uh, or infected cell lines or embryonated eggs. Because these are obligate intracellular parasites, it's not possible to culture them using our standard laboratory methods. They won't grow on petri dishes. These organisms are arthropod-associated. Um, they replicate within uh, the tick, whether that's in guts, ovaries, or salivary glands, and they have a sylvatic cycle. So there's a, a cycling of the pathogen between its uh, vector and some sort of reservoir species. So whether that's a tick and perhaps a small rodent, a raccoon, etc. We also see transmission between ticks, and this can be transstadial, so as the tick molts and, and moves into other stages of its life cycle. We can see vertical transmission from the female to the eggs, and horizontal transmission or venereal transmission between ticks. When ticks are colonized with a species of Rickettsia, so the genus Rickettsia, they tend to only be colonized with one species. If we consider some of the organisms within this order and their vectors and primary reservoirs, uh, starting with Rickettsia rickettsii, so this is the agent of Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, it's vectored by dermacenter species ticks, and its reservoir is rodents. Rickettsia prowazakii, vectored by the human body louse, and its primary reservoirs are humans and flying squirrels. Rickettsia typhi, we see vectored by fleas with a primary reservoir of rodents. Anaplasma phagocytophilum is vectored by Ixodes ticks, and its reservoirs are small mammals and deer. Ehrlichia canis is vectored by Rhyphocephalus ticks, and its main reservoir are dogs. Ehrlichia chaffiensis is also vectored by ticks, but we find it in a wider variety of reservoir species, deer, canids, ruminants, and rodents. And then finally, Neorickettsia helminthica, is vectored by Nanophytia salmonicola, which is actually a fluke, and its reservoir are salmonid fish infected with the fluke. So these organisms can have really complicated uh, life cycles, and it's important to understand not only the bug, but the vector and the primary reservoirs in order to really holistically understand the epidemiology. Taxonomically, uh, within the genus Rickettsia, we have 29 species five species of anaplasma, nine of Ehrlichia, and two of Neorickettsia. But these are not organisms that we typically identify using sort of our classical bacteriological techniques. We're not culturing them and doing biochemical tests. Um, our diagnosis of these organisms relies on primarily serology, so identifying uh, an antibody response to these organisms, or potentially by PCR so identifying DNA signatures associated with each species. In veterinary medicine, one really important tool is this IDEX uh, 40X SNAP test. So this is a patient side test where you can put a drop of blood from your patient into this reservoir. It flows across this membrane, which allows the detection of antibodies for a variety of vector-borne bacteria, including those listed below. If we look at how these bacteria are related to each other at a very high level, so we have our order Rickettsiales, our Rickettsiaceae family, which contains uh, Rickettsia rickettsii and Rickettsia prowazakii, and then our Anaplasmataceae, which includes Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, and Neorickettsia. 
For Rickettsia species, it's important to know that these organisms are invertebrate symbionts. So there's many, many of them out there, um, most of which are not clinically relevant. So Rickettsia rickettsii is sort of one of our uh, archetypal spotted fever group Rickettsia. Well, Rickettsia prowazakii is sort of an archetypal uh, member of the typhus group, along with Rickettsia typhi. The virulence factors of these organisms are really not well described, and I think it's actually more useful to think about the tissue tropisms of these bugs rather than the specifics of the molecular interactions between the host and the organism. So our Rickettsia species tend to infect the vascular epithelium, our anaplasma we find on erythro erythrocytes, platelets, and leukocytes, while Ehrlichia and Neorickettsia tend to be associated with leukocytes. There are many diseases associated with these organisms, so Rickettsia rickettsii causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever in both people and dogs. Rickettsia prowazakii and Rickettsia typhi are primarily organisms that we're concerned with from a human health perspective as a cause of epidemic typhus and maureen typhus, respectively. Anaplasma phagocytophilum causes tick-borne fever in ruminants, horses, and humans. Anaplasma bovis and marginale cause two different diseases in cattle, um, bovine ehrlichiosis and bovine anaplasmosis. You can appreciate here ehrlichiosis probably reflects the taxonomic change that happened uh, previously. Ehrlichia canis causes canine monocytic ehrlichiosis while Ehrlichia erwingi causes canine granulocytic ehrlichiosis, and Ehrlichia chaffiensis causes human ehrlichiosis. Neorickettsia helminthica causes salmon poisoning in dogs, and Neorickettsia rustichii is the agent of Potomac horse fever. We're going to start our discussion today with Rickettsia rickettsii, so the agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, this disease was first described in the 1890s in pioneers or colonists who were moving west across North America, and the disease was initially known as trail fever. Um, this was a disease that had a really high mortality rate, and so there was a large burden of illness that those early colonists had to deal with. This organism is named uh, after Dr. Howard Ricketts, who you can see here, so both the genus and the species bear his name. Interestingly, as a physician interested in vector-borne diseases, um, Dr. Howard Ricketts actually died of typhus. Rickettsia rickettsii affects both dogs and people, and it's been identified all over North and South America with an increasing incidence uh, since the 1970s. Clinical signs in dogs, um, fever would be the most common. We can also see edema um, of the extremities, so this can be on the lips, the scrotum, or the pinna. And these animals may develop uh, petechial or echematic hemorrhaging, so the spots that we associate with, with the organism. We can see joint pain and swellings, myalgia, and neurological signs likely associated with uh, vascular lesions in the brain. Because this is a vector-borne disease, it occurs seasonally, typically between March and October. Um, here in Saskatchewan, maybe that's a little bit different because we do have such a short season and such a long, harsh winter. Rickettsia rickettsii is vectored by uh, exodes ticks, so hard ticks, uh, the American dog tick or Dermacenter variabilis, and Dermacenter andersoni, the Rocky Mountain wood tick. Uh, these are the possible vectors that would be most likely encountered in Western Canada. While well, Rufocephalus sanguinis, or the brown dog tick, could be seen in the southern United States and into Central and South America. Here in Saskatchewan, we're in kind of a sympatric zone where both Dermacenter andersoni and Dermacenter variabilis are possibly encountered. Um, Dermacenter andersoni has been seen in Saskatchewan and Alberta, while variabilis is seen more on the eastern side, so Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and, and western Ontario. As you can imagine, if we were to extrapolate the range of each tick um, on these maps from the US CDC north of the border. In people, rash is really the classical sign of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And in this image here, you can see a late stage uh, infection. So we have this spotted rash on the foot. But we can also see other signs like fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, injected conjunctiva. 
Uh, Long-term sequelae and consequences of these infections are related to vascular inflammation and thrombosis. So we get hemorrhage and thrombosis of organs or brain, leading to a variety of uh, pathologies depending on the site of that hemorrhage or thrombosis. This is a disease that is not reportable in Canada, so we don't have um, good national level data about its incidence. But in the United States, it does seem to be increasingly commonly reported. So this is some information from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control from 2000 up through 2019. And you can see quite a large increase in the number of cases which are reported annually from around 500 in 2000 up to over five to 6,000 uh, in the late 2010s. Interestingly, while the incidence of Rocky Mountain spotted fever is increasing, so you can see on this red line here, the annual incidence per population. So that's on this left side uh, y-axis from 1920 all the way up to 2017, sort of low and smoldering, and then it really started to take off since the 2000s. The incidence is going up, but the case fatality has really dropped. So in those early days, we had quite a high case fatality rate. You can see in this blue dashed line here, maybe up close to 30% back in the 1940s. That dropped off quite precipitously in the late 1940s and has continued to go down since then. Maybe just pause the video for a minute and think about what may have happened around this time that would maybe explain this decrease in mortality. Well, I think our best explanation is that this is when tetracycline was introduced. So tetracycline became available in 1948, and this is still the treatment of choice for rickettsial infections. Tetracyclines have long been associated with uh, deposition of the drug in bones and teeth, um, and so there's been a reluctance on the part of some physicians and also veterinarians to use this drug in neonatal animals and young children. But in the case of rickettsial infections, um, doxycycline is really the treatment of choice. And um, there's no evidence of tooth staining when used as a short course therapy, as would be recommended for treating rickettsial infections. You can find more information about this um, on the CDC website. Rickettsia prowazakii is the agent of epidemic typhus. Um, the clinical disease begins with sort of mild flu like symptoms. We can then see a rash neurological signs, which vary from a headache all the way up to coma. If untreated, it takes two to three months to recover fully, and there's potentially quite a high mortality rate. So up to 40% of people who are infected and not treated can die. Rickettsia prowazakii is spread by Pediculus humanus corporis, the human body louse, and people are really the primary reservoir. Interestingly, uh, Rickettsia prowazakii has also been associated with flying squirrels in the southern United States, and these are another potential reservoir species. In this image here, uh, you can see Rickettsia prowazakii um, that's been grown in embryonated eggs. So this image was from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. Um, certainly not something that we would be doing in my lab. <laughs> this is both a level three organism when grown in this way and requires specialized techniques and facilities that we simply don't have. Epidemic typhus has classically been a disease of the most miserable conditions that people have endured. So when we have filthy conditions and high human density, um, these are the types of situations where typhus really uh, thrives and infects a lot of people. Historical outbreaks um, include apparently over 2 million Native Mexicans in the 16th century. There were probably tens of millions of cases in the trench warfare of World War I, possibly leading to up to 3 million deaths, so a pretty profound impact. One example that I think of as being particularly compelling and tragic um, is that of Anne Frank, whose diary provided a really, I think, valuable uh, account of what it was like to hide from the Nazis during World War II. Um, Anne was ultimately taken to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, where it's been speculated that she died of uh, typhus in these conditions. Um, here on the right, you can see an image of Bergen-Belsen. And then this picture on the bottom is from the U.S. military predating World War II, but really emphasizing to soldiers that they need to take 
uh, lice and, and parasites seriously, um, that typhus can be a deadly condition and that it needs to be dealt with immediately. Anaplasma marginale, the cause of bovine anaplasmosis, occurs between 30 degrees south and 40 degrees north, so probably not something that we have a lot of here in Saskatchewan. Um, in young animals, so those cows less than one year old, infection is typically subclinical. And then interestingly, the disease is more severe in older animals. So in those greater than two years of age, we see the most severe disease. Severely affected animals can be icteric and anemic um, due to extravascular hemolysis. They're febrile, they have decreased milk production, and severe infections can progress quite rapidly and, and be fatal quickly. That Boss Indicus cattle are perhaps more resistant to anaplasma marginale than Boss Taurus, like we would typically have uh, here in Canada. In this image, you can see anaplasma marginale on bovine blood smears. So these dark basophilic structures associated with the erythrocytes are all of our anaplasma organisms. Treatment of bovine anaplasmosis really relies on tetracycline. You'll see that come up as a theme again and again in this lecture. The tetracyclines are really our, our treatment of choice for the rickettsiales. Supportive therapy, so fluids, potentially blood transfusions may also be necessary. There is a killed anaplasma marginale vaccine, which is used in some areas to protect against the most severe disease. In this image here, you can see a post-mortem uh, uh, examination of a cow who died with anaplasmosis. And what I want you to appreciate is that we have mild to moderate icterus that's seen really across the abdominal viscera, indicating hyperbilirubinemia associated with the extravascular hemolysis that we see with anaplasma infections. Mm -hmm.